Welcome to Awake Us Now with Pastor Chris Dodge. Our programming today is sponsored by Awake Us Now. If you are questioning whether Jesus really did live, or if you want to be equipped to answer questions like these, then we invite you to join us today for Pastor Chris Dodge's teaching from The Living One. Today, around the world, in hundreds of languages, followers of Jesus are going to be saying the same thing. Two phrases that have been spoken for centuries, and they go like this, Christ is risen, He is risen indeed. I'd invite you to say it, Christ is risen, He is risen indeed. That, my dear friends, is the heart of the Bible's message. You cannot read the scriptures without realizing that everything stands or falls on the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. His triumph over death and the grave, over the very devil himself, his power that enables us to look to the future with confidence, with assurance, with hope, and with great joy and peace. Everything stands or falls on the resurrection of Jesus. It is the heart of the New Testament scriptures. It is what the Hebrew prophets in the Old Testament predicted over hundreds and hundreds of years. And today, you and I have the opportunity to reflect on the greatest message the world has ever heard. But make no mistake about it. This is not simply one of those little stories from the Bible. This is the heart of the Bible. And the Apostle Paul, nearly 2,000 years ago, made it very clear that without the resurrection of Jesus, we have no hope. This is the way he expressed it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 14. Something that was written just about 20 years after the resurrection of Jesus. The Apostle Paul wrote and he said, And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. He was writing to dedicated believers, and he was making it very clear, if Jesus is not alive, then we have nothing, and our faith is absolutely useless. But if Jesus is alive, it changes everything. And so today, we are going to tackle a question that has caused many to ponder and reflect for nearly 2,000 years. It is an incredibly important question to ask, particularly in this very skeptical day and age. And the question is simply this. Who would invent this? Who would invent the resurrection of Jesus? You know, over the years, I've had the opportunity to talk with many people and correspond with many people who have considerable doubts and many questions about the New Testament, about the teachings of Jesus, and specifically about his death and resurrection. I've encountered people who don't even believe that he ever existed, and I'll just say that is something that even atheist historians say is ridiculous. It is very clear from the evidence that we have outside of the New Testament that there was a Jesus, that he was crucified, and that his followers declared he had risen from the grave. That, my dear friends, is just simply a fact of history. And those who've bought into crazy conspiracy theories need to look once again at the evidence itself. Because if Christ hasn't been raised, our faith is useless. But if Christ has been raised, you desperately need him. Not just for today but forever. And so today, my prayer is that we will accomplish two things here. The first is to encourage those of you who are followers of Jesus in your own faith and, and to give you tools for witnessing to that faith to other people whom God brings into your life. But my second prayer is that what I'm going to share here today will be something that will speak directly into the hearts and minds of those of you who do not believe in Jesus, who have considerable questions, doubts, great reservations, or have simply dismissed it and are merely going along for the ride right now. I pray that as we talk about the question, who would invent this, that the Holy Spirit is going to speak into every one of our hearts and our minds and our very souls.
So, let's deal with the question, who would invent this? We're going to take a look at five different things that come out of the New Testament scriptures and out of the earliest testimonies we have about the death and resurrection of Jesus. Five things that cause us to look at the New Testament and simply say, no one in their right mind would invent this as a story. It has instead all, all of the indications that these things really happened. And where we're going to begin is with cowardice. You know, we human beings like to put on a good face. We, we like to uh, tell stories that make us look good. Uh, we, we'd rather not be totally embarrassed by an account of what happened in our previous life. And when you look at the New Testament, one of the things that you see is the people who wrote down these words, eyewitnesses, individuals who were intimately connected with all of these events. They did not hesitate to say how badly they failed. Cowardice is all over the pages of the Gospels. Individuals who knew Jesus, who walked with Jesus, who talked with Jesus, who saw his great miracles. When push came to shove on the week that we call Holy Week, they failed miserably. Let me just give you a few examples. First of all, I just want to say, not only did they fail miserably, but this is embarrassing stuff. If you are a follower of Jesus and have to admit the things that these individuals had to admit, you would be embarrassed. I believe so were they. For example, one of Jesus' followers, one of the twelve, a man by the name of Judas Iscariot, was an individual who, alone among the twelve apostles, held an office in the ministry of Jesus. He's described in the New Testament as the treasurer. He, he had a, if I can put it this way, he had a church office. And yet, he would sell his soul for 30 pieces of silver and then regret what he would, had done. And rather than turning to the Lord for forgiveness, he took his own life. You look at that, it's embarrassing. Someone who was with Jesus for possibly as long as three years or so and blows it in the end. But he's not the only one. We look at the disciples, the rest of them, the 11. They were with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. They saw him arrested. And then they ran like scared rabbits. They were out of there. And we don't see them at all, with two exceptions, in the rest of the story of those hours that went forward from Thursday night by our calendar until Sunday morning. They were cowards. They ran. And then you have the example of Peter, the one who spoke the boldest, who said after the Lord predicted they would all flee, Peter said, not me, I'm ready to die for you. And Jesus' response to Peter was, I tell you, before the rooster crows twice, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter did. He cursed like a trooper in front of a little slave girl, claiming he never knew the man. He had nothing to do with him. And Peter, one of the great leaders in the early Jesus movement, was an absolute failure on the night when Jesus needed him the most. Only one of the disciples would actually be at the cross John, it is, quite frankly, an embarrassing record of cowardice. And it makes you pause and think, who would write this down and share these things about themselves unless they knew it was true and unless something had changed them totally? Which leads us to the second thing. A... Uh, Second cause for looking at the New Testament and scriptures and saying, you wouldn't invent this. And it all revolves around the crucifixion itself. You know, we've become accustomed to Jesus on the cross and uh, his burial, the story of his resurrection. But the fact is that in the first century, 
the very concept of crucifixion was scandalous. You wouldn't invent a great hero who's crucified. It just doesn't work for the culture of the day. In fact, this is what historians refer to as the principle of dissimilarity. And what it means is this. The early believers proclaimed a message that no one in the Jewish world expected. There was absolutely no expectation that the Messiah, whom everyone was looking forward to in the first century, no expectation that the Messiah was going to be crucified. Because crucifixion, frankly, was a sign to devout Jewish people of rejection by God. In the Torah, they were told, whoever is hanged on a tree is cursed of God. On top of that, the humiliation of crucifixion is absolutely mind-boggling. Stripped naked, brutally beaten, nailed to a cross, can't even scratch your nose. Today, many medical scholars believe that Jesus died of heart failure of asphyxiation. That's the argument. Which of the two? The fact is the New Testament says he chose to lay down his life. But crucifixion is just not what you would invent to win the world. It's that simple. A third thing, what I've labeled corroboration. The individuals who first told the story of Jesus' resurrection. Again, the story is familiar to many people, but because of its familiarity, many people do not realize how radical the New Testament account is. Because our culture is so different today, but their culture was uniquely different from our own. You see, when you look at the Gospels, all four of them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, one thing becomes very obvious and very apparent, and that is the first eyewitnesses were women. Some of them are named. Others are simply described as other women. But one thing is sure. In the first century world, not just in Judaism, but in the Roman Empire, in the Arab world, in all of the known world at that time, the testimony of women in public was scandalous. Romans had a rather uh, advanced view of men and women, but they still considered that a woman's place was in the home and that men would handle everything else. In the Jewish world, men were the ones who were called to testify. In the rest of the world, it was true. If you were going to invent a story of a resurrection, which in and of itself is remarkable and miraculous, you wouldn't invent a story that emphasized women were the first ones to see him alive. Jesus always broke the expectations of his day. And the New Testament is very clear that the first ones who testified he is risen from the grave, the angels told us we saw him were women. And I might add, in another one of those little episodes that's embarrassing, the men ridiculed them. In fact, in Luke chapter 24, verse 11, we're told that when the women came to the disciples and told them they had seen Jesus alive, the disciples did not believe the women, and I quote, because their words seemed to them like nonsense. The reaction of those men was the same reaction that many people today have. This can't be true. This has got to be nonsense. It's not the sort of thing you would invent to win people's hearts and minds. Why do you put this down? Because it's what happened. Because you know it is wrong to bear false witness, as the commandments say, because you know, although the truth may hurt, the truth is of more value than anything else. You don't invent this. You relate what happened. There is a fourth item, 
And that is just frankly confusion. Confusion all around. Not just confusion amongst Jesus' friends, but confusion amongst his enemies as well. Uh, the fact of the matter is, no one expected this. The disciples were not looking for Jesus to rise from the grave, even though he had told them that's what was going to happen. In, in fact, in, in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus relates very clearly that he's going to be crucified. But they still, they just don't get it. It was totally different from what they expected, what their culture said, what they believed was true. After all, dead people who are crucified don't come back to life. It is so incredibly brutal. And the Romans were so incredibly thorough. Well, no one expected it. Well, almost no one. Because the high priests who orchestrated Jesus' crucifixion would go to Pilate and say, we need to have guards over the tomb. Because this guy said, they apparently listened to Jesus better than the disciples did. They said, this guy predicted that he would rise on the third day, and we've got to make sure that nobody comes and steals the body. And in doing that, they weren't expecting a resurrection, but they wanted to make sure that no one would pilfer the tomb. No one expected Jesus to rise. And finally, courage. That is something else that stands out in both the New Testament scriptures and in the record of early historians, both believers and non-believers. There is one thing that everyone is agreed on, even those who did not believe in Jesus, and that is this. These individuals became incredibly courageous. You would not invent this kind of story if you wanted to win hearts and minds. But these individuals were bold and courageous. They risked, and ultimately many of them gave their lives, rather than deny that Jesus had risen from the grave. That in and of itself is a powerful and incredible testimony that ought to cause us to look at this more closely and to realize you wouldn't invent this. Some have suggested over the years that the disciples just lied. They made it all up so they could write a best-selling book. Well, let me tell you, the royalties never reached them. But there's something else you need to realize. And that is, I'll just put it this way, liars who know the truth make notoriously bad martyrs. If the disciples did lie, they knew they were lying. You know, if the, if the body was buried in the backyard of John's place up on the Sea of Galilee, it is amazing that none of them recanted. Liars who know the truth make notoriously bad martyrs. But we have the testimony from early believers and non-believers alike that these individuals were willing to boldly lay down their lives rather than deny the name of Jesus. And that, dear friends, ought to cause every one of us to sit back and reflect and seek, seek the guidance of the Spirit of the living God. Because, quite honestly, the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus is remarkably powerful. And in the last generation, a huge sea, chain, sea change has taken place among those who are historians and theologians, both believers and unbelievers, atheists, agnostics, and devout followers of Jesus. Even Jewish historians and theologians freely concede that the evidence, both from the New Testament, but also from the records of the Romans and the Jewish people of that era, the records clearly indicate there was a Jesus. He was crucified by Pontius Pilate. His disciples did claim that he had risen from the grave, and they banked their lives on that. That is a powerful testimony. And I believe the only reason people dismiss that 
is because we have not come to grips with part of our culture. A culture which has said miracles don't happen and God doesn't exist. But if God does exist, and I believe He does, and I believe the evidence is becoming more and more powerful all the time, then God does these things. And this is the hope of the world. A great deal of study has gone in to the resurrection of Jesus. In fact, an individual whom I first encountered over 40 years ago, at that time he was a professor here in Michigan. He has written extensively on the resurrection of Jesus and, in fact, is today considered the greatest scholar on Jesus' resurrection in all of the world. As one other very brilliant scholar has put it, uh, this guy right up here, Michael Lacona, he says, only one person knows more about the resurrection of Jesus than Gary Habermas, and that's Jesus himself. Just a short time ago, Gary Habermas published the first of four volumes that basically sum up the research that he and many others have done over the last 60 years. This volume, it's a hefty volume. It's right up here. It, uh, it's thick. It's over a 1,000 pages. It's weighty. It weighs five pounds. I checked it out on the scale. I read it just recently. It is not what you would call beach reading. It is loaded with footnotes. It quotes scholars from all backgrounds and all beliefs. But it lays out a very clear case as the result of a lifetime of study that he has risen. He has risen indeed. And dear friends, I personally am convinced Jesus changed my life. I grew up in a Christian home. I always believed in Him. I believed in God. But I had plans for my life, and my plan was go to the Air Force Academy and become a fighter pilot. That's, that was my goal and my desire. Then I got into an argument with a pastor over of all things politics, and I decided I would prove to him that Jesus would support my political view. I started reading the New Testament as a teenager, and it absolutely changed my life, and it changed the trajectory of my life. It's why I have been a pastor for about 45 years now. I have seen in the Scriptures the truthfulness of God and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. I've encountered him personally in my own life. He has changed my mind and changed my heart in addition to my direction. Over the years, I have seen him move in remarkable ways, things that frankly cause me to fall to my knees in awe. He is real, and he is risen, and you and I desperately need what only he can provide, because only the living God can save us. And only the living God can pay the ultimate cost for our rebellion against him. And that is the heart of the gospel's message. That the Lord himself came down, took on human flesh. That he willingly went to a, went to a cross for us. Suffered the humiliation and rose from the grave. So that by faith in him we could live forever. He is the hope of the world, but he is also the hope of your life and mine. And on this day, I say, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And the evidence makes that very clear. I'd like to conclude with the words of Jesus, who said, as we started this series several weeks ago, Revelation 1, verse 18, I am the living one. I was dead, and now look. I am alive forever and ever. Amen. Thanks so much for listening to Awake Us Now with Pastor Chris Dodge. Today's program was sponsored by Awake Us Now. We hope today's message was a blessing. If you are asking yourself, now what? We encourage you to learn more about God at our website, awakeusnow.com. And please come back and join us again next time.